Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you guys are here, whether you're in person or maybe you're joining us online. We're grateful to have you. And our hope and prayer is that this will become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of a series called For the Church, For the City, uh, where we're kind of talking about what's our future as a church and uh, how do we impact today, but also how do we impact the future as well. And uh, this series is a little bit different. Um, and we've been encouraging people to uh, just be in prayer and fasting. And so many of you guys have joined us. We did a 10-day fasting challenge. And so many of you guys joined us on that. And we've been doing uh, these fasting days on Wednesdays as well. And I sent out a little devotional. So I want to encourage you, uh, jump on board with us uh, if you haven't already. Uh, it's a great way to just uh, seek after God and what he has for you and ultimately what he has for you in this series as well. And then last week... We gave out these booklets. Um, you can find these. There's a table in the corner. We can put it in the normal spot because it's too windy. Uh, and that's part of the problem of not having your own space. Uh, you deal with somebody else's stuff. And so, uh, but there's a table over there and it's got these booklets. If you weren't here last week, uh, this will give you a little bit more information about uh, kind of what we're dealing with, the campaign that we're in and stuff like that. Within here, there's some really cool stories uh, of people whose lives have been changed here at our church. And uh, one person recently told me that the single greatest decision they've made in their life was to attend our church. And they talked about how it just helped them come to Christ and, and then other things began to change in their life. And they said that was the single greatest decision. I thought, man, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're in a campaign to try to build a building and all that so we can make room for more people. So we can have more people who can say, hey, coming to this church was the single greatest decision because it helped me come to Christ and changed a lot of other things in my life. And uh, and so let me, today, it's going to be different the first few minutes, okay? Um, uh, then we'll get into the typical message. If, this, if you're new, if this is your first time, man, just bear with us. It's not typically like this, but if you call Front Range your home, then we got to go over through some, uh, some like family business, uh, if you will. So this campaign we're in, it's a two-year giving initiative. So what we're asking is we're asking people who call Front Range home over the next two years to give above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings, um, what we're doing is we're building a building. Uh, you may know we have some land uh, at North Castle Rock, and uh, man, it's a great piece of property, but we've got to build a building on that at this point. Uh, and what's that going to do? It's going to help us to reach more people, to care for our community in greater ways, and uh, to be able to just expand as a church. We were talking about this the other day, that uh, we've, been a, uh, we've been a church for eight years. We've met in nine different locations. Uh, that's not really a recipe for uh, church health and church growth. In fact, we were talking about it. We were trying to name all the churches that have been portable in the last few years. Uh, we named 18 churches that have been portable, like us, in the last 18 years. Two of those churches moved into a permanent facility. Uh, four of those churches are still portable, we being one of those. And the other 12 either no longer exist or no longer exist in Castle Rock. So there's a clear correlation between having your own place and being able to grow and reach people and care for people and all of that. So what's it going to take? The goal is $4 million. Uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, honestly, man, I've just been begging God that he would move mountains, that he would uh, put it on people's hearts to give generously, that he would uh, do what, man, I can't do uh, and uh, what I can't convince people to do. Uh, God's got to move in a substantial, substantial way. Obviously, $4 million is not going to pay for the land and the building. And Lewis, we're building a really tiny home. Uh, uh, it, then maybe. But the land costs more than that. So we've got great um, financing secured and all that. But the only way we get to a shovel into the ground is by raising $4 million over the next two years. With that number, it's going to take all of us. All of us who call Front Range home is going to take all of us to say, man, we're in. And we're in substantially. You know, it's not just, hey, we're in, but... We're going to be willing to sacrifice uh, at a high level. What we've done is we've created this chart of gifts uh, that you can see on the screen. Uh, and if we reach those, then we reach $4 million. That's why we try to break it down to show, okay, here's what we need people to do. And so when we go, oh, I'll give $100, well, that's not on the list yet. Uh, so, you know, we, th this is kind of breaks it down to what we need uh, to be able to reach that $4 million goal. Obviously, there's substantial gifts on there. Uh, so what we've always said, every person's in a different place spiritually and in a different place financially. Uh, for some of us, we can give a lot. For some of us, we can't. For some of us, I man, we're there spiritually and we're, we're, we're going, okay, God, what do you want to do? For others of us, we're just kind of new to this journey. So we've always said it's not about equal giving, it's about equal sacrifice. Meaning that my giving may be different than yours, but may our sacrifice together be the same. May we both be going, God, what do you want to do? What, how do you want to stretch us? 
This coming Saturday, we have an advanced commitment night, uh, which just basically means if you're a leader in our church, if you go, hey, we already know what we're going to do, and we want to come, we will kind of be first fruits of that, then come here Saturday night. Uh, we're going to have a catered meal. We're going to have child care. Uh, we're going to do some, some prayer, some worship. Uh, and then us as leaders, we're going to kind of step forward first. You see that all throughout Scripture where the leaders take the step forward first. So if you want to be a part of that, we need you to RSVP. There's a, a, a QR code on your worship guide, or uh, you can text the word LEAD to the number on the screen, and that just helps us know who to plan for uh, so we make sure we have enough food for everybody. And then Commitment Sunday, where we say, hey, everybody come back, let's do this together, is November 13th. Okay, so make sure you're here on November 13th. Don't miss that day. That's going to be where we all join in together and go, okay, God, use us and our sacrifice to build this future home. Uh, and then lastly... Uh, I want to walk through this commitment card. There's been a lot of people have asked me questions about like, how does this work and what do you need and, and all of that stuff. So let me walk you through a commitment card. Uh, first, I'm blown away by the people who've already jumped in. I mean, we just, there's so many people who've already given uh, incredible, incredible uh, sacrifices and I'm blown away by that. But I know for, for most of us, we're going, well, how, do, how does this work? Well, let's say you were to go, hey, God's calling me to give $50,000. Okay, let's just put that number out there. Uh, so 50,000, the two best ways you're gonna get there is one is a first time, a, a one-time gift. That one-time gift might be $20,000, say out of stored assets like cash or uh, stocks, maybe selling a, a vacation home or I heard about a lady at one church uh, she, uh, her husband divorced her. She kept the ring, and she never uh, thought how God would, would use um, that ring to kind of redeem the situation. And her church went through something like this. She felt like the Lord said, give that, so she gave it. The church was able to sell that ring for $100,000. Uh, that's a nice ring. Uh, but God was able to redeem that, right, like redeem that situation with her, which I think is just truly incredible. Um, and so maybe you say that, okay, here's a one time, and then I'm going to do, say, $700 a month for two years. Uh, I'm going to do that on a monthly basis. Well, if you're good at math, I grew up in South Carolina, so I'm not good at math, but if you're good at math uh, and you do 20000 plus 700 a month, that doesn't equal 50000 So how else do you get there? Well, maybe it's bonuses. Maybe you have quarterly bonuses yearly. Maybe tax returns. Maybe you sell a kid. Uh, knee, kid knee, uh, don't sell your kids yet, um, but uh, maybe you, uh, other ways, right? And so you have this one-time gift, you have the monthly gift, and then maybe there's some other ways. That's the only way my wife and I are going to get there, is by kind of these, these three different ways. And as you're praying through this, here's the deal, you're probably going to get two numbers. The first number, at least I did, the first number is a safe number. It's a comfortable number. It's like, I, we can do that. Like that, that, there probably won't be a lot of change in our, in our lifestyle. We won't have to change a whole lot. We can do that. The other number is a faith number. It's like, I don't know how I'm going to get there. And like when we prayed through it, we got those two numbers. We chose the faith number just because we want God to stretch us. And if God's telling us to do that, then God's got to be the one that supplies it. Like at the end of the day, he's got to be the one that provides us with, with what he's telling us to give. And if you've never given or if you're like skeptical of the church, this is a great way to jump in because it's tangible. Right? Like you know exactly where your money is going, is going to this building. If we're able to raise the funds, guys, we'll be in a church, in, a new church building in a little over a year. Isn't that incredible? Like a little over a year, yeah, if we can do this. So, and I'm just praying that God would move mountains. And here's the deal, this, this kind of stuff, if you're new, I'm, it's awkward. Uh, it's awkward for me. I was telling somebody the other day, like I did not get into ministry to talk about money. Uh, I did not get into ministry to ask people for money. So it is hard. Uh, it's challenging, uh, and yet I know that this is crucial to take our next step as a church, to reach more people, to care for more people. Um, and honestly, what I'm praying for is that there would be, like, discipleship happening in us. Like, the other day, I, I went to look to see how much we've already been given uh, to, to the campaign, and so I went and I looked it up, and I'm like, oh, man, that's awesome. And I started getting excited, which is abnormal for me. I don't usually get excited about giving money away. And I started getting excited. I'm like, okay, what else can I do? Like, what stocks can I sell? And I started, like, thinking through all the things that, that we have and what we can get rid of and how we can do things. And I found myself excited. I'm like, man, God is, like, changing my heart. Like, in the process of this, he's changing me. And that's my prayer, ultimately, is that we would draw close to him. So let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in this place. I thank you for renaissance and allowing us to rent this place and for allowing us to be in nine different locations and how you've still grown our church and all of that. But God, as we step into this, may you move. God, move mountains. Move mountains in my life so I can give the number you're calling me to give. God, move mountains in, in our church family so that, Father, we can step forward in faith and trust in you, God. And we just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, I'm so excited about the time period we've been studying, the content we've been looking at over the last few weeks uh, where we've been diving into the Israelites and uh, the, this time period that's called the Babylonian exile. Uh, and uh, what we've looked at is how culture is changing and as culture around us changes, it rubs with us and rubs our values as followers of Jesus and, and a lot of times just as human beings. Uh, but also the global church has some issues as well. And so we look at that and we go, how do we respond? Well, there's a few ways. You can integrate which means you just become like everybody else. You can isolate, which means you say everybody's evil, stay away from them. Or you can impact, which means you step into the darkness. You'll go, okay, God, I have the light of Christ in me. I'm going to step in and step forward, and you use me to change the world around me. The only way we do that is to love unconditionally, uh, is to invest sacrificially, and then to live by faith. With a show of hands, how many of you would say it's difficult to live by faith? Anybody? Okay, good. A few more. The last service, it was like three of them. So they're all like super holy. Uh, but the rest of you are normal people. That's good. It's difficult. Like I think back, think back to the moments of your life where God has called you to live by faith. Like I think back to the moment of salvation where, where I was presented with who Christ is and what he's done for me. And I thought, man, this is a hard step. Like no one else in my life is taking this step. No one else, no one else in my family was followers of Jesus. Like I would be very different if I do this. Plus, you're talking about a guy that lived a long time ago. How did he impact me? How did he change? He changed my eternity? Like, how does that happen? Like that was hard to understand, but yet I was being called to take a step of faith. I think about when we first became followers of Christ, Sarah and I got married and, and we were making no money, like 18000 a year. And I was putting her in through school as well. And God called us to tithe. And we're like, how? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, this is so difficult. And yet we took this step of faith. Think back to moments where God called you to take a step of faith. And maybe it was to end a relationship that wasn't healthy for you. Maybe it was to start a business. Maybe it was to send your kid to a particular set, uh, school or to live by faith. I mean, you know, ordering seafood in Colorado. Like, you have to live by faith to do that. Like, think back to times where you've had to live by faith and it's hard. And the only way we live by faith is by trusting God. But what does that mean? Well, the word trust, the definition is this. It's a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability or the strength of someone or something. So to live by faith, to have trust in God, means that you trust, you have this firm belief in his reliability, truth, ability, and strength. Makes sense. I, I could say, yes, I trust that God, I have a firm belief that God is reliable, that he's, that he's able, that he's truthful. I could say yes to all of those, those things, and yet it's still difficult for me to trust in God. How do I do that? How do I trust God on a daily basis? We're gonna look at a guy in scripture today that, was really the epitome of trusting in God. I mean, he was like the ultimate role model, if you will. His name is Daniel, and his story is found in Daniel chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. It's on the screen. If you need a Bible, we have them. We usually have a tent outside, but it will blow away today. So we have a table. So you can just go to the table. The Connections team will get you a Bible. We'd love to get you one. Um, And let me set it up for you. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he's besieged Jerusalem. Uh, and he's starting to take away some of the treasures and uh, the gold and stuff like that. And now he's starting to take away some of the people. Again, referring to this as the Babylonian exile. That's where we pick up the story. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 says this. Then the king ordered Esphenes, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The kings assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. This, stop right there for a moment. This is the way that the king would to assimilate uh, these people, these exiles, into the Babylonian culture. It's a good old Babylonian brainwashing, right? I mean, what they're trying to do is they're trying to take away their religious beliefs. They're trying to take away their cultural heritage and their understanding and all of that and make them depend on the courts. They were schooling them in their language and their mythological uh, literature and things like that. They, they were feeding them from the king's table, And this was to remind them of where their daily bread came from, that their daily bread came from the king. No one else, not God, not not their hard work, but the king. So they have to rely on the king. They would take them away from their home, brainwash them, remove everything they knew, and it only gets worse. Look at verse 6. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names 
to Daniel, the name Betashazar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Michelle, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, these four guys, they had great Hebrew names that represented God. I mean, think about what goes into a name. If you have kids, you thought about the names of your kids for a while. You weren't like, uh, how about this? That sounds good. Like, you were like, okay, who do I know with that name? I don't like them. No. You know, okay, if we do the song, Hannah, Banna, Banana, like, no, that's not good. You know, like you, would, like, you would think through, right? Like, the meaning of a name and stuff like that. Like, it's important. And these guys, their names were so important, and they just wiped them away. And they gave them names that represented the Babylonian gods and worship of the Babylonian gods. We think our culture is rubbing against our values. They're changing their names. And yet we still see these young men trusting in God. In fact, I would say that they show us how to trust in God. Look at verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Daniel shows us what the first truth about trusting in God, and that's this. Trusting God always involves choice. Trusting God always involves choice. So the scripture says this, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. The, the Hebrew literally means he set securely at the deepest level of his being. Like at the innermost part of his being, he's like, I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. I'm not going to partake in these things and defile myself in this way. Trusting God is always, it always involves a choice. Like God is going to pursue after you. God's going to do everything he can to draw your heart to himself. I mean, he died for you, and then he's going to do everything he can to draw you to himself, but he can't force you to trust in him. I mean, why? Because trust is a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability, and the strength of someone. You can't force someone to have a firm belief in someone. You can't force that. The other day, my, my daughter and I, we were out in the garage, and, um, and I don't know if this is a parenting fail or a lesson for her, I'm not sure which, but uh, I was doing some stuff, and she was carving a pumpkin. Um, and so she carved one, and it was good, and then she started on the other one. Well, her hand was slippery from the pumpkin juice, and it slipped down the knife and cut her pretty, pretty good on two fingers. So she said, Dad, I just cut myself. I said, okay, let's go inside, and let's wash your hands off. And as I did, I realized, like, she cut herself really good. So I knew immediately we were going to have to go to the hospital or an urgent care. And uh, so I told her, I said, hey, we're going to have to do something. We're probably going to have to get stitches or something like that. And she just starts sobbing. And she's like, Dad, no. Am I going to be okay? You know, it was like, you know, as an adult, you're like, you're fine. Like, I started telling her, like, I've got, I had stitches here, I had them here, I had them here, I had them here. You know, like, I like, and she's like, uh, that doesn't help me at all, you know. But uh, I'm like, okay, look at me. Waverly, really, look at me. And she looked at me and she's sobbing. I said, I'm your father. And I'm here with you right now. And I'm not going to leave you and I will hold your hand during the entire time. You are going to be okay. And she stopped crying. She said, okay. What was I doing? I was saying, you can trust me. You can have a firm belief in me. I think God tells us that all the time. Like when God calls us to do something, we're like, ah, I'm not sure. God, are you in this? Are you, are you going to be faithful here? And God's like, what have I already done for you? Like look at how I've already shown up. Like I created you. Not only that, but I died for you. No one else has died for you. I died for you. But I didn't just stay dead. I then raised myself from the dead. Like you can trust me that I'm faithful, that I'm good, that I have ability, that I have power. All of those things you can trust me. But at the end of the day, it's your choice to trust them or not. Trust always involves a choice. It always requires for you to choose. In the book of Joshua, it says, choose this day whom you will serve. I think that's what God's saying to us, not just today. Will you trust me today? Will you trust me in this hour? Will you trust me in this moment? The choice is ours. Trust always involves choice. Daniel trusted in him. A second truth that we learn about trust from Daniel's life is that trusting God doesn't always make sense. It doesn't always make sense. So God gives Daniel favor with the, the chief official, and he says, hey, I'm not going to eat. And the chief, chief official's like, whoa, hold on, man. If you don't eat, like, this could be bad. And if it's bad, I'm going to die. And here's Daniel's response. It says, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had pointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them 
for 10 days. This makes absolutely no sense. I mean, to reject the food from the king's table, the best food, the best drinks, this is going to help their body be the strongest, their mind be the sharpest. That makes absolutely no sense. And yet trusting God doesn't always make sense. And can you imagine the other Israelites looking at these four guys going, what are y'all doing? Like, we're also Israelites, but we're going to eat this food. Hey, guys, if you, if you do this and it doesn't go well, you can be killed. Hey, guys, just listen to the king. Just obey him. Do what he wants. You get into a service. You'll have the money. You'll have the protection. Your retirement will be set up. Everything will be good. You'll be fine. But trusting God doesn't always make sense. Uh, for me, I, I grew up in a, a pretty wealthy home, and then my parents uh, got divorced. And when they got divorced, then all the, all the wealth was taken away, and, uh, and it was hard. And so money became a security blanket for me. And I've kind of mentioned this in previous sermons, like, man, I really wrestle with, with money because it's always provided security. If I have it, I'm good. If I don't have it, there's worry, there's anxiety, there's all of that. And so I've always wrestled with that. And then when COVID hit, my wife didn't work for a few months. And so we were like, uh-oh, like we have to make, we made major changes in our budgeting and how we spent money and all of that. And so for the last couple of years, like she, it's been coming out and things have been good and she's been working a lot more and all that. And we're like, okay, we're good. We're like, we're like kind of back to maybe a little bit ahead of where we were prior to COVID. And now we feel like God's saying, hey, I want you to commit this. And we're like, come on. Like we feel like we just started getting rolling again. And now you want us to give this away? Or like looking at my stock and selling my stock, this isn't a good time to sell stock. Like this is like the absolute worst time to sell stock. Like trusting God doesn't always make sense. Like when God calls you to do something, it doesn't mean that you're going to be like, yeah, that, that works. That perfectly fits in my plan. Trusting God always involves choice. It doesn't always make sense. And lastly, trusting God always requires surrender. Trusting God always requires surrender. Look at verse 18 at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into a service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Ten times better than everyone else. Not just better than those who were also in the same system. Not just those who were being trained over the last three years. Better than everyone in the entire kingdom. Why were they better? Because they chose to surrender. Like in their mindset, it was like, okay, if, if this doesn't end well, we're placing our trust in God. If the king ends up killing us, we place our trust in God. If we don't get chosen for the king's service, we place our trust in God. They just kept surrendering to him. Surrender. I hate this term. I grew up in a military family, so the word surrender was a curse word. I remember my dad would, would want to wrestle me, and he would say, oh, let's wrestle. And I'm like, I could take you, old man. He was like 35. I'm like, I could take this guy. He's so old, you know. And, and so we would, we would start wrestling. I had no clue about this thing called man strength. You ever heard of man strength? You haven't heard of man strength before? It's because you're not a man. Okay, man strength happens when you're about 26 and a half years old. It's scientifically proven you just get stronger as a man. When my dad had man strength, I had little boy strength. And so my dad, he wraps me up. And this happened literally every time. I knew it was coming. And he would grab my fingers in such a way, and I thought I was going to die. I'm like in pain. And he would say, say it. And I'd have to say, I surrender. It was a dirty word. And in our culture, surrender is a bad word. But what does surrender mean? Here's what surrender means. It means to cease resistance and submit to another's authority. It's marriage. Uh, no, it's joking. Uh, <laughs> cease, <laughs> cease resistance and submit to another's authority. In war, it's bad. It's how you lose. Spiritually, it's how you live. To cease resistance against God and to submit to his authority, it's the only way you live. It's the only way you, you win. It's the only way you find freedom is to surrender. But surrendering never guarantees that we'll get what we want. However, surrendering to God always guarantees that we'll align ourselves with his will, with his best for our lives. 
Surrender is something that Kevin and Tiffany Brown uh, chose to do in order to trust God at a deeper level. Take a look at this. Hi, I'm Tiffany. I'm originally from Dallas, Texas. Grew up in Texas, lived in Florida for about 15 years before moving to Colorado seven years ago. I grew up Southern Baptist, and I like to say we were pretty much in church every time the doors were open. Hi, I'm Kevin. I grew up in Central Florida. We moved to Colorado in 2016. Our background was Methodist and Baptist. However, uh, we weren't really active participating in church. It's really non-practicing. Um, and borderline agnostic, really, until we came to Front Range in 2018. January of 2018, um, I hit bottom of depression, um, just in a really, really dark place. Uh, suicidal thoughts, you know, the, the thoughts of, well, really, I, you know, everyone else's life might be better if I wasn't here type thoughts. And the one thing that I was missing was, was hope. And you don't realize that you're hopeless until you feel like you're in a hopeless world. We kind of had a real serious sit down where I said, there's some things that I think you have to do and some things I think you need to do. And one of the things that I said, you really need to do is go to church with me. I started coming to Front Range and I went to therapy and, and changed some medications and uh, started really working on my mental health. And over a really quick period of time, um, within three to four weeks, I uh, started finding the hope and the joy um, and creating a relationship with Jesus and went through a, a really great process with the front range steps in regards to joining community groups and being a part of the overall volunteering and community of church and uh, tithing and, and giving. Um, and throughout that process, I mean, in a very quick period of time, I, I committed my life to, to God and Jesus and um, everything else has really been so much easier. and and better since that day. The first time we were back at church and uh, I was able to get baptized as soon as they had them. I felt like my heart was gonna explode. Like, so just like pure joy and happiness to know that we'd spend eternity together. And I watched and I cried, but I also looked around at so many people who I know had a hand in it because God put them there. The church that I was raised in and, and really more of my family upbringing was more around fear, right? To fear God, um, to always be afraid of what I was, whatever I was doing was gonna be a disappointment to God. You know, I'm a, obviously kind of the long haired hippie looking individual. I thought that I would be judged the moment that I would walk into a, a church, um, that I didn't fit the, the church going profile. Um, and the beautiful thing was coming to Front Range and just didn't feel at all judged. And for me, that was, it was absolutely huge, right? I, was, I wasn't gonna be judged in our church. Never felt like I have been judged, um, other than people giving me smiles and, and hugs and just glad that I'm there. And that if I'm being judged on that, that's pretty cool. We had been attending regularly for not that long, probably four, four to six weeks. And it was the generosity sermon. You know, when I grew up in church, you always knew when it was coming. <laughs> and so um, there was the sermon and Ernest said, he said, you know, it's the only time in the Bible that God says, test me, when he talks about tithing. It's the only time he says, test me. And I'll never forget, Ernest said, we want you to test us. If you tithe for, I think he said 90 days and you're not blessed, then come let us know and we'll give you your money back. I said, yeah, this is a, a money back guarantee, I think was actually the words that he used. I'm like, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. And it was instant. Uh, in all honesty, the Holy Spirit started moving through in ways in, in our lives that I never would have realized, uh, whether it be of us meeting people, um, getting way more involved in our community. Both businesses really started to take off and, and doors started opening. You know, God just started working through our lives at, at an amazing, amazing pace and there was burning bushes everywhere when it came to any decisions that we were making, financial decisions, spiritual decisions. When you're able to trust God with your finances and make that step and then you see that He comes through, He does what He says and it just deepens that level of faith and trust so much. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So where's God calling you to put your trust? Like what area of your life do you need to surrender over to him to be able to deepen your faith in him? 
Maybe for some of us, it's ultimately with what Christ did on the cross for us. Maybe you came into this place and every single week we have people walk in here that you know, would say, man, I, I've been trying to do it on my own and it's just not working. You know, I've been trying to live my life and do the things that I think are supposed to work and it's just not working. And God brought you here to say, come home, come home. What does that mean? It means doing what I talked about I had to do a long time ago, which is place my faith in Christ, that, that God loved me enough to send his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sins. So that could be forgiven. So that could have eternity with him. So I could find freedom and hope and life like Kevin was talking about. And so maybe for you, that's your first step today. It's a commitment of Christ or a recommitment to Christ. Maybe for others of you that Man, where do you need to trust God more is some other area of your life. Maybe it's in a relationship or maybe it's with some worry, anxiety that you've been holding on to. Maybe it's in this for the church, for the city deal that we've been talking through. Where do you need God more? Where do you need to trust him at a deeper level? Where do you need to surrender? I'm gonna pray for us. And as I do, just say, God, what do you want me to surrender to you today? And deepen my faith and my trust in you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you. I thank you for your mercy and your grace in our lives. I thank you that you love us so much that you continue to pursue us, God. And that even us being here today is not, not by accident, it's not by mistake. It's not even because this is typically what we do on a Sunday. It's you drew us here to hear from you. And so God, as we hear from you, God, may we surrender over to you what you're calling us to do. Father, first for that, the first group of people, Father, that like Kevin was talking about, and like I alluded to in my own story, Father, that maybe we've walked in here and we feel far from you. We walked in here and we thought, man, I, I don't know if I can believe that or I'm not there yet or whatever. And yet being in here and listening, God has been drawing us to himself. God has been saying, just come home. You may still have questions. You may still have doubts and all that. And as a church, man, we'll walk with you through all of it. But today, maybe you're ready to say, oh, I, I want to take a step of faith and I want to commit my life or recommit my life to Jesus. I want to trust in what Jesus has done for me. If that's you, with every head bowed and eyes closed, you'd say, today, man, I want to commit my life or recommit my life to Christ. I just want you to raise a hand. I want to know who I'm praying for. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for each one of these individuals. If you're watching at home, you can simply text the word follow to the number on the screen. And I just want to let you know that God sees you. He knows your story. He has not abandoned you. And he's so proud of the decision you're making right now. And then for all of us, God, tell us what our next steps are. What area do we need to surrender over to you? Maybe it's with our kids. Maybe it's in our marriage. Maybe it's another relationship. Maybe it's in this for the church, for the city. Whatever it may be, God, may we surrender it to you today. May you move mountains on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen.